Greetings everybody. Today is the 28th day of the month of November. And the, well, so let me see now, the uh, 15th day of the month of Kislev. It's like a full moon last night and the night before and I think the night before that, it's been a beautiful moon shining over Olmec at this midpoint of the month. And uh, one more week and it'll be uh, Hanukkah. And uh, two weeks after that, it will be Christmas. <laughs> mm -hmm. For those who observe Christmas, which of course we we don't really observe Christmas because it's a pagan holiday that came comes out of ancient the Saturnalia of the Roman Empire and the ancient worship of Nimrod and Semiramis and Baal, the sun god, and and the pagan deity Mithras. So we don't uh, worship on Christmas because Christ wasn't born anywhere near Christmas. In fact, my research indicates he was born in the month of February, very likely February or early March. And we don't know exactly for sure, but people are very mixed up on that. But I think my article on the birth, death, ministry and resurrection of Christ uh, goes into that in quite some detail in the article I wrote on when was Jesus Christ born goes into great detail. And I think it's important to learn these things and to know and to have an understanding so we can keep growing spiritually and not get stuck in a bog or a, in the swamp or in quicksand and or as I used to say uh, the old Uncle Remus stories get stuck on the tar baby. You know that story about the tar baby Br'er Rabbit and the Tar Baby. You know, Br'er Rabbit was singing jauntily and to himself as he was hopping down the road and came across this tar baby, this uh, tar object uh, leaning against a, a stump or a log on the road next to the road. And he said, Hello! Tar baby, because Burr Rabbit was feeling his Cheerios, his oats, he was feeling good, and he said, Hello, sir. And the tar baby didn't say a thing, because it's just being out of tar. Mm -hmm. And didn't say a thing, and Burr Rabbit said, What? Mm -hmm. I said, Hello to you, sir. Didn't you hear me? Hello. Tar baby didn't say a thing, and Burr Rabbit got mad. He got angry, and he kicked him with his foot. And when he did that, that was a mistake because his foot got stuck in the tar. Oh. And he said, let me go, let me go. And he tried to free his foot. He couldn't get loose. And he kicked him with his other foot. Both, and was, both feet were stuck in the tar. Then he punched him with his fist and his fist was stuck in the tar. And punched him with the other fist and he was totally stuck in the tar. Then along come Br'er Fox, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And said, oh, oh, Br'er Rabbit, I got you this time. You're stuck. I'm going to take you home and put you in the pot. Mm -hmm. And you're going to be stew, rabbit stew tonight. Mm -hmm. And Br'er Rabbit was new. He's a goner. He's a loser. He, he was really had it. I mean, he'd been taken, snookered, deceived by Br'er Fox's trick. And so Br'er Fox had held him over his shoulder and was taking him home to put him in the stew pot. And Br'er Rabbit looked across the field and saw a great big thorn patch of Briar. brambles and briars and thorny bushes. And he said, oh, Br'er Rabbit, you can take me home. You can cook me in the stew pot. You can do anything you want. But please, Br'er Rabbit, don't throw me in that thorn patch. Please don't throw me in that briar patch. I hate Briar Patch. It's horrible, terrible torture. Don't throw me in that Briar Patch. And Br'er Fox hates Br'er Rabbit. And he says, ah, I'll really make it nasty for you. 
All right, Br'er Rabbit, so he threw him in the briar patch. And when Br'er Rabbit landed in the briar patch, now he was free. Now he didn't have to face being a rabbit stew anymore. And he started cackling and laughing, gleefully jumping up and down and saying, Oh, Br'er Fox, you didn't know it, but I was born in a Br'er briar patch. It was his home. Born in the briar patch, and so he was, he escaped by the skin of his teeth from certain death, and he was now in the briar patch. Well, you know, we all can learn a few lessons, I think, from Br'er Fox and Uncle Remus and the stories of our youth and realize that we need to endure to the end and don't be taken in by deceivers and deception and don't lose our tempers. Don't get angry and do something stupid or foolish. A lot of lessons we can learn from this story of youth and even Uncle Remus and Br'er Fox, Br'er Bear, and Br'er Rabbit. But today we have some other lessons to learn, not from fairy tales and rhymes, but from the Word of God. And before I get into that, I have a few prayer requests I want to pass along. I got an email this week from Jim Fleetwood, who was with us for the Feast of Tabernacles this uh, year. He came all the way over from South Africa and spent the week with us, and we enjoyed his company very much. Well, he's gone back to South Africa now and says, Greetings, Mr. Dankenbring. My little 11-month-old grandson, Axel, is extremely sick with E. coli, and they are flying him from Zambia back to Johannesburg, South Africa tonight for advanced hospital treatment. Treatment up in Zambia over the past week has not worked. Please request all the church members to pray for his quick recovery. Thank you, Jim Fleetwood. So, brethren, I want to call upon you all to remember his, Jim's little 11-month-old grandson, Axel, who's very sick with E. coli. Remember him in your prayers. Lift him up to God in your earnest prayers for his healing and recovery. Then another email comes to Walter and Debbie uh, from Nana, Korea. Uh, Nana and Dave Korea, as you know, are longtime church members. They've been with us for many years. They used to be with the Worldwide Church of God before that. And uh, David has been in the hospital the past week because of his neuropathy and diabetes and heart condition. And in the email, Dan sends to Debbie and Walter and says, It is very sad news because David will be gone soon. His doctor said David's heart is no good. He's had a very weak heart. Had a pacemaker put in several years ago. His urination is no good also. His heart is very low in pumping. It is hard for me to explain to you. My daughter, Alana, and her husband came over bringing the leftover Thanksgiving dinner and the small whole cooked turkey. We had a lunch together. Then we went to see David in the hospital and had the meeting with the doctor and the intern. The doctor explained to me with my daughter, Alana's help as the interpreter. As you know, uh, Nana is totally deaf. But Alana was able to be an interpreter. And, and uh, so she said, David is still sleeping and cannot respond to me anymore or anyone. His eyes were upward, lids almost closed, and his mouth open. 
and breathing had a breathing problem like before. I cried and held my head up in understanding his health issues. I will see David this morning, this Sabbath morning. I will report to you tonight. I got the two cards from William and Cappy yesterday. I will send them the thank you card soon. You both take good care and keep hugging each other with a big smile. So brethren, David's diabetes and heart condition has become progressively worse and he's been in the hospital. He's almost, uh, I guess he's almost uh, not responsive. So Nana's being prepared by the doctors uh, for his passing. And I want to encourage everyone to pray for her and for David and for God's mercy and God's will to be done. Because God knows the timing for each one of us when we're going to be born and when we're going to die. I think that's clear from Psalm 139. And elsewhere, that God knows all of our members even when they're in the womb. And the number, and the number of our days, He has it planned out. He is working out a divine purpose here below, and contrary to what you may have been taught, God is in charge. He rules the universe. He is the sovereign king of the universe, guardian, protector, guide, lawmaker, lawgiver, life giver, and our Heavenly Father. And so everything is working out as he pre-programmed and planned it from the beginning. And we are part of his plan. And he has called us to the knowledge of his truth and his way of life and to salvation. He's given us a special, wonderful calling. Very few people in the world today are being called. Very few are going to be among the first fruits of God's kingdom. But yet for some reason, which of course we can never understand, He chose us and made us, fashioned us in the womb, <coughs> and has called us and planned to do so. And He's using us in His work to be a witness to the world and to each other and other people in society until Christ returns and then we all join him in the kingdom of God. In the meantime, we are yeah, the top part. his people, his church, his chosen ones, chosen to do a job, chosen to fulfill a commission, chosen to preach the good news of the gospel of the kingdom of God to the world and to encourage the world to repent and return to God and to get to know the true God, the creator of heaven and earth. And then I have one other request, prayer request, for Mrs. Golden, Haile Kaida's mother. She's 90. She's, she will be 90 uh, very soon, I think this coming month or so, and she's living back near Hiley now, back back near, uh, uh, well, in Illinois, and she is uh, seeing the doctor for x-rays of her foot. Her left foot and the big toe are swollen, and she has uh, plantar fasciitis which is, makes it very difficult for her to walk on her left foot. Neuropathy. And she also has neuropathy of her feet, which makes, makes it a lot of, very painful. And she can't really walk without Hailey's help at this time. And there is neuropathy in both feet. And there may be a tear. And there may be a tear from the uh, plantar fasciitis. Mm -hmm tear near the heel 
or, or back of the heel. Mm. And but she's relieved there's no diabetes. But they did, they were told by the doctor that okay. there's no signs of diabetes, so there should, there's no reason to fear any uh, amputation okay. or, <laughs> or, uh, any of those kind of symptoms. Her blood pressure is very normal. Mm, and other than that, uh, she's pain. in good health. But please pray for her. For the pain. Mrs. Alfred Golden, Haile Kaida's mother. For, pray for her healing and for the tests to come back the way they should and for God's intervention and her healing and well-being. So that's, that's the uh, prayer requests I have that I can, Paul uh, well, I also want to remind you to pray for Paul and Melody Pettyjohn. Paul is still essentially, in essentially almost bedridden. He's, can't walk. He can't walk well, even with the walker. With bulging disc in his And he's got problems in his back from a fall he had several years ago. He fell about, I think it was 14 feet. 14 feet. And uh, hurt his back, and now it's coming back to plague him in his old age. And in, in addition to uh, Paul and Melody, uh, who else? I just was, was on the tip of my mind, and uh, somebody said something, got my mind off the other person that's going to ask you to pray for her. Well, I want you to pray for Jeannie Jett. She's a older person that's been in the church for many years, living in eastern, in western Washington, down near the Columbia River. And uh, she and has just done. recently had to move, and things were not going well where she was living. The the neighborhood's gone to the gangs, and so she's moved up into the mountains of central southern Washington to a very nice mountain community where she grew up many years ago. And I don't know if it's the same house or not, but anyway, she's found a house up there where the people were trying to sell it for the last several years, and they couldn't sell it. And they knew her back in the days when and she was up there to look and find a place to stay, and she found this wonderful little house furnished. that they had all furnished. And uh, they invited her to stay there and rent at a very nice low rent. And since they couldn't sell it, and uh, I think they're Jewish, but I may got they may have got that mixed up. Anyway, it's, God has opened the doors and blessed her with a wonderful place to stay. And now she's looking to get another little dachshund, I think, a little dog, because her previous dachshund pet died back in October of, the, of, last, of this year. And so she's looking to find one to replace her because she wants to have some companion, and a little dachshund would be just the ticket for her, so please pray that God will intervene and see that she gets the dog she needs to help her live out her days in comfort and well-being. She's very handicapped. Walking. She herself is quite handicapped and diabetic. Uh, from diabetes and uh, can't walk much, mm -hmm. as, I, as I, I understand it. So please pray for her also. And if there's anybody else you can think of to pray for, pray for them. Please. <laughs> I can't think of everybody, and my mind has gone blank. Our senior, we have a lot of seniors. That oh, I know who I was going to ask you to pray for. Myron Wells. Oh, yeah. Back so, in Wichita. He was, he's, uh... Had a tooth pull. Well, Cappy's trying to tell me everything to tell you. Uh, I guess he had a tooth pulled. And it's... Swollen now, and, it's and now her, her his face is swollen on the side. Yeah, pretty much. And so he can't talk too well. He's going to see the doctor, I guess, on Monday because they're not available during the weekend. Unless he had to go to an emergency room, and it's not an emergency. 
So please pray for all the brethren and all God's people and, and, the, prisoners. and the prisoners and all those who are suffering persecution and God's people around the world. And, you know, brethren, let's stop being hypocritical and self-righteous and mumbling and feeling all kinds of self-pity for ourselves because of our background and our past and what happened to us years ago. I mean, people can look on their back history, lives, and probably get pretty depressed and say, well, why did I ever get involved with that church? Look at me now. I don't have anything because I listen to those people and they taught me to be self-righteous and, and they said Christ was coming back in 1975 and, and I believed them and and then, you know, and I, I didn't even buy a house or buy houses because I didn't invest in the future because I thought Christ was coming in just a few years. And the ministers seemed to be saying, you know, put all your money in the church and in the work and so we can have fat salaries. And don't worry about buying houses or investing because Jesus will be here in just a few years. Well, did he come in 1975? No. And so a lot of people didn't make any real plans for the future, and now they're living their lives with very little to show for it, physically. And they're depressed. And they're questioning this, that, and the other thing. And they're just kind of down in the dumps and down in the doldrums, and it's sad, you know, we need to perk up and, you know, realize that God's hand is in our lives, and he's allowed us to go through these tests and trials, and he's trying to teach us wisdom, and it seems like so often we're dead set against learning wisdom, we're kind of stubborn in our own self-righteousness, and don't want to admit that it was our fault that we listened to those BB brains in the ministry years ago. You know, Solomon says in the book of Proverbs, the prudent man looks well to his going, his journeying, his life, his living. But the simple minded pass on and are punished. They believe every word they hear from some authoritative source and wind up making big mistakes. Oh, the thing to do today isn't to cry in our beer and and uh, weep tears of remorse over yesterday's problems, but just to forget the past and concentrate on the future. Keep your eyes focused on the kingdom of God. As Christ himself said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all the things you need, other things, will be provided for you. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 31 through 33, some, something like that. You know, somebody else, my wife was talking to someone yesterday, uh, re recently anyway, and uh, they've gone through a lot of trials too. You know, and different, different families have gone through different trials and tests. Some have lost children. Some have lost children brothers or sisters. Uh, some are just just kind of woe be gone because they their life is kind of falling apart and maybe they and their wives aren't even in the same church anymore. At least they're together with their wife. That's a blessing, I would think. But, you know, we have to learn to give God thanks and be grateful for our situation no matter how humbling it might be. You know, we just came through the Feast of Thanksgiving up here in OMAC, and you did, and we all have, and I love Thanksgiving. It's my favorite feast of the whole year. You know, if I, I'm not counting God's holy days now. I love the Feast of Tabernacles, and I love the Feast of Passover. But Thanksgiving is just a very wonderful, special place in my heart because it is dedicated to God, to worshiping God, 
to giving thanks to the God of heaven and earth who gives us life and breath and health and who watches out for us, sets his angels about us and protects us. I was watching a couple of films this and how they made the Mayflower, Mayflower Compact and all agreed to vote for a government and they would be a democracy a, and not everyone have their vote and especially the men I guess and they God provided for them a miraculous place to land that was fertile and the Indian tribe that had lived there had been wiped out by a plague in the two years before they arrived the whole tribe was wiped out except for one man of that tribe who was at that time a slave in England learning English and who was allowed to come back to the new world brought by the English and he searched for his old tribe and they were all dead and all the other tribes had stayed away from that area because they didn't want to be infested with the plague it was like uh, they were fearful of dwelling in that cursed spot to them and so this was called uh, his name was uh, no, what was his name Squanto Squanto I think Disquanto or Squanto they called him then he spoke English anyway to make the long story short he made friends with the pilgrims who settled on that very spot, told them about the Indian tribe that was now all decimated and destroyed, and he became their friend, settled with them, taught them how to plant corn and to take dead fish and use them for fertilizer in the cornfield and plant the beans and the squash right along with the corn, and they would nurture each other and produce a wonderful crop and that's what happened he helped save their lives and save their colony and they made peace with the local Indians which God also overlooked and foresaw and this is largely taken from the pages of William Bradford's history of the colony and his journal well you know now think about it, the pilgrims were Christians. They were not part of the state church of the Church of England. They were not Catholic. They were striving to get back to the faith once delivered to the saints. They were searching the scriptures to learn how to live. And they were called Puritans or Separatists because they didn't go along with the established church of England or the Catholics. They were separated. They didn't even keep Christmas. They called the others kept Christmas. They, they said Christmas is pagan. And possibly Easter too. They didn't keep the pagan holidays. But they did observe Sunday as the Sabbath. They'd inherited that and even though it was wrong, they observed it uh, faithfully as best they understood. They assumed that the most Christians do today, the Sabbath was done away with the Law of Moses. You know, you read the book of Galatians and the New Testament, you can get that feeling. Unless you're educated and someone shows you the right way, you could easily conclude that the law was nailed to the cross, the law was done away, now we're not under the law anymore, and, and that the, the you know, that no man judge you about matters of the law, Sabbath or holy days. And if you misread those things, you can say, well, yeah, see, we don't have to keep the laws of God because those are ritualistic type laws and they're all abolished. But if you read carefully, you find out, well, no, that's not what Paul was talking about. He was saying, don't let a man judge you regarding those things. There are pe people that are human beings and who are critics of the flesh. Your neighbors or other churches, don't let them judge you. But God is the judge. Christ is the judge. He will be our judge. Romans 14 says that plainly. 
And Paul says there, don't judge one another. Don't be critical of one another. In other words, I would say, brethren, don't be critical of somebody just because they keep Sunday. And don't think you're more righteous than they are because you keep the Sabbath. It's a point of knowledge, a point of understanding, and it's a blessing to know about the Sabbath, but it's a curse to become proud and lifted up and arrogant about it. Not to just be humble and thankful for whatever knowledge you have. And don't look down your nose at other people just because they keep Sunday or even Easter or Christmas. They don't understand the knowledge of those things, then just feel sorry for them or, as the case may be, just feel love toward them and don't judge them. I don't go around judging people if I can help it. If they go contrary to God's word and begin to begin to be spiteful and critical of the word of God and of this ministry that we're doing and, and kind of go off the deep end, then I have to be critical and I have to judge according to the evidence and sometimes put them out of the church and, and stop the fellowshipping. You know, we know that happens. People go nuts. They go AWOL. They become paranoid. Like one man we had up here in OMAC that just went bananas with his self-righteous megalomania. Thinking he's one of the two witnesses, I guess. So. Well, he's flown the coop. He's gone. Put he put himself out. I just acknowledged the fact and told everybody that he was branded and and uh, put out, marked as the Apostle Paul said, because of his teaching falsehood, and false doctrine. And maybe one or two people followed him out. That was to their own detriment. They should have exercised wisdom and caution and ask God to deliver them from the influences of Satan the devil. But some brethren, some of you, are still being influenced to some degree or other with attitudes you developed years ago in the worldwide church of God, attitudes of self-righteousness and condemnation of others just because they're ignorant about this or that. I think I said several months ago or a year ago, I don't know when it was, you remember the beach at Libya where all those Coptic Christians were lined up on the beach by ISIS and they were all blindfolded, I think. And they were, or maybe they weren't, but the ISIS guys were blind, were, had hoods over their heads. Anyway, they were all lined up on the beach, kneeling in the ground and all beheaded on a video. And ISIS uses that as a recruiting tool to bring more people to join their fanatic Islamic religion, which President Obama says is not Islamic. But it is Islamic, you know, if it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, and swims like a duck, it's a duck. And Obama says otherwise, then Obama's a duck. Quack, quack. An Islamic duck. He pretends to be a Christian, but he's really a duck. He pretends to be an American. But all the evidence shows me he was probably born in Kenya, where his family's from. You can read books on that, but at any rate, the point I'm trying to make is too many of us are being fooled by others and hypocrisy is rules the world today and even those of us who've been in world the worldwide church of God in the past we've got to be awfully careful of our attitude of looking down at other churches and other people in the world because we were so proud I think it's a fallback to 
Roderick C. Meredith, who used to preach as an evangelist in the Worldwide Church of God, making fun and ridiculing other churches and other ministries. And he'd say, they'd go around saying, Root toot toot, we're the girls of the Institute. Root toot toot, we're the girls of the Institute. I don't know where he got that phraseology or that slogan. But he's making fun of people who go around saying they belong to this church or that church or that institute. But he and the Worldwide Church of God people were just the same. They made fun of everyone else saying they had the truth. No one, no one else had the truth. In fact, some of the ministers used to give sermons saying, God doesn't hear the prayers of other people in other churches. He only hears our prayers, brethren. My wife says that was GTA said that. Uh -huh. I don't, well, if he did, then he was a nut. Garner Ted Armstrong was a nut. And his father was deceived as well. And he was sometimes a nut. I look back at the facts. Just the facts, ma'am, as Joe Friday used to say on the Dragnet television yeah. program. Just the facts, ma'am, just the facts. We don't need to hear all your emotion and uh, additions. Just tell us what happened. The facts. Well, I looked back at Worldwide and I saw a lot of facts didn't add up. Herbert Armstrong was totally wrong on divorce and remarriage. And he ruined marriages and families and split up children from their parents because of his asinine, stupid interpretation of the marriage issue. He, how did he get into that predicament? He didn't know Greek. And he assumed he did know Greek. So he misinterpreted the Greek word porneia, and he said it just means premarital sex. He got that out of his own head, or Satan the devil put it in his head, because the Bible doesn't teach that. Any Greek dictionary, or biblical Dictionary or Jesenius Greek, I mean uh, Thayer's Greek English lexicon will give you the definition of that word, porneia. It means immorality, adultery, fornication, all of those things, not just premarital sex. So he got it messed up, ruined people's lives. And I could go on and on. I don't want to do that. I just want to point out, brethren, we need to stop being so self-righteous about judging everybody and being critical of everybody and realize that none of us has all the truth. There's no prophet out there today that has all the truth. Jonathan Kahn has been used to God to reveal a lot about the Shemitah year and the downfall of America. In Isaiah chapter 9, I think it is, uh, about the harbingers and the fall of ancient Israel, comparing it to the modern day dealings that God is doing with America today, the tribe of, we say it's the tribe of Ephraim. I say that, primarily. Jonathan Kahn doesn't know that, but he still sees the parallel between the fall of ancient Israel and the 9-11 attacks on the Twin Trade Towers of New York. And God has used him to reveal that. Mark Biltz has pointed out to us the significance of the four blood red moons on or near the holy days of 2014-2015. Now these things aren't don't prove exactly when the tribulation begins and when Christ is going to return but they give us a strong indication that we're living in the very last days. These things are significant. The rise of ISIS is significant. America's total collapse of our foreign policy under Obama is very significant. Well, that being said, my, my whole heart Brethren, is that we need to stop judging each other 
and other people and get our own lives right with God and, and learn to be thankful. Learn to be thankful and gracious and appreciative. As the Apostle Paul said, Brethren, give thanks always in all things. In Ephesians chapter 5, Verse 20, Paul says, Giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Have we reached that point of spiritual maturity? Can't we get that right? Yes. Notice verse 19. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Trying to upbuild and give faith to one another and hopefulness to one another. Upbuilding one another. Speaking to one another by our psalms. Psalms of David. The hymns that we sing. And spiritual songs. Uplifting songs. Making melody in our hearts to the Lord. Giving thanks always, he says, for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Submitting to one another in humbleness in the fear of God. And he goes on. In verse 20, Psalm 34. Verse 1, Psalm 34, verse 1, I'm just, whoops, turn over there, where David says, I will bless the Lord, Ye Jehovah, at all times, his praise Praises shall continually, that means always, every moment of every day, continually, be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in Jehovah. The humble shall hear of this fact, he said, and they will be glad. Then he says in verse 3, Oh, magnify Jehovah with me, join me. And let us exalt his name together. That's the attitude God wants. He wants us to have the attitude of David. This is a psalm of David. Of blessing him always with our mouth. At all times. Praising him all day long. Magnifying him in our hearts. And in our words, exalting his name, Yehovah, together as one. You know, an attitude of gratitude is the attitude we ought to have. An attitude of sheer gratitude, from morning till evening, from from dawn till dusk. In, in the book of Philippians, the Apostle Paul says the same thing. He says in verse chapter 4, verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I will say, Rejoice. Are you rejoicing today or finding fault, complaining, reacting, down in the dumps, down in the tombstones? Or are you rejoicing in God, in Christ? 
He said, that's your gentleness, your humility. Be known to all men. Be humble. Don't be critical. The Lord is at hand. He is coming soon. So don't be worried about the past, about the investments you could have made or should have made. Just pick up your life where it is today and go forward. Don't look backward. Go forward. Look ahead. Paul said that. Notice in chapter 3 of Philippians here. Paul says that he was a Jew. Verse 5. Circumcised on the eighth day of the tribe of Benjamin. A Hebrew of the Hebrews, he said. A Pharisee, blameless. Concerning zeal, he even persecuted the church. Concerning righteousness, which is in the law, the Torah, he was blameless. He kept it correctly, which a lot of people today don't. They disagree with the Apostle Paul because he, as a Pharisee, kept the Feast of Pentecost on the sixth day of Sivan, 50 days after Passover. But people today say, oh no, that's wrong. You have to follow the Karaites. You got to keep it on Sunday every year. Like the Worldwide Church of God now says. They used to say keep it on Monday every year, then they switched to Sunday every year. The way back in the 1930s, Herbert Armstrong used to actually keep it on Sivan 6 with the Jews. Then he got led astray and led the whole church astray twice. Once he switched to Monday every year and then in 1974 he switched to Sunday. He never got it right. Well, I don't have to prove that to you or anyone else. You can prove it yourself, brethren. But I have proved it, and I'm convinced of it. And Paul goes on and says, though, about his previous life, the things that had gone before, he says, But all those things, verse 7, which were gained to me, I have counted them as a loss for Christ. I'm not upset. I'm not bitter about what I had to change or give up to follow Christ, he said. I'm, I've just divorced myself from my previous life. I'm no longer a part of mainstream Judaism, but I'm following Christ, the true Messiah, the true shepherd of the Jews, the true interpreter of the law. In fact, he says, indeed, I count everything a loss to get the excellency of the knowledge of Christ, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of my whole previous life, the loss of all things, and I count them like garbage, rubbish, trash, so that I may gain that which really counts, Christ. The kingdom of God. You get that? And so that I might be found in him now. Not having my own self-righteousness. Where I look down my nose and belittle other people. Or churches. Which is legalism. But be found in him. That which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which is from God by faith that he will redeem me and save me. Christ will. Not my keeping every point of the law perfectly. We don't save ourselves by keeping the Sabbath on the seventh day or keeping the holy days on the right day. Many people may keep them wrong on the wrong day. And yet Christ will forgive. He may well forgive a lot of people on those things where he has not enlightened them to the truth. We can't all be right 
on everything. Before we are right, we should be thankful. And what we don't know, we don't know. You know, the old saying, if you don't know, you don't know, you don't know. You just don't know, you don't know. Pray to, to God for he that he will alleviate your ignorance and teach you the truth. Now, how do you get the truth? By searching for it. Asking for it. Searching for it. You know how I learned about Daniel's 2300 days, a 2300 years prophecy, Daniel chapter 8? I'll tell you a little story. Years ago, my daughter was in high school, and she had, I think it's high school, it might have been even middle school, and she had to do a paper on Alexander the Great, and she wanted a little help to write her paper. So I said I would help her, and in my own Bible study at that time, I was studying the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel and chapter 8, which is about the he-goat, the Grecian goat, running against the ram of the Persian Empire and decimating it, destroying it. And I read in Adam Clark's commentary. Well, first of all, I was reading the Bible on my knees and prayed as I was reading that chapter. And I asked God to give me understanding of what that's talking about. Real understanding. What's the 2300 days? What was that about? I prayed for that and then I was doing the paper for helping my daughter and Alexander the Great. Well, the he-goat in that passage was actually talking about Alexander the Great, the head of the Grecian kingdom. And he led his army of about 30,000 troops storming across the Granicus River into Asia Minor and defeated the huge army of the kings of Persia and all their generals. And I thought, well, when, when did that occur? When was that? And I read in the World Book Encyclopedia about that war, and then I read in Clark's commentary on Daniel 8, in the footnotes, that that was Alexander the Great crossing the river Granicus. And Daniel 8 mentioned that they, they, they came upon the Persians at the river. And they smote them at the river. So I knew then, well, that's the river Granicus. So when was that? And Adam Clark said that was 334 B.C. The year 334. And then later on in that chapter, it says the angel says to Daniel, or another angel, and Daniel overheard, saying, how long shall be the vision? Concerning the goat and the uh, ram. How long? And he said to 2300 evenings and mornings. And in ancient Israel, there was an evening sacrifice and a morning sacrifice each day of the year. So 2300 evenings and mornings meant 2300 days. But interpreting the Prophecy, remember, each day represents a year. Numbers 434, or uh, Numbers 14, verse 34, God said a day for a year. In Ezekiel, chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, he was told the day for a year principle of interpreting prophecy. So I said, well, okay, so let's take 2,300 years from 334 B.C. What do we come to? So I subtracted it. And it came to 1966, except there's no year zero, so you have to add in a year to get the correct count on the year. So it came to 
2,300 years from <clears throat> 334 B.C. brings you to 1967 A.D. What happened that year? Anything of any significance to fulfill the prophecy? It was the year of the Six-Day War, the most miraculous war in the history of Israel. In six days, they pulverized, slaughtered the Egyptian army, the Egyptian Air Force, the Syrian Air Force, the Syrian tanks in the Golan Heights, and the Jordanians in Jerusalem. They all went to war against Israel and Israel annihilated them and captured the Golan Heights, the west bank of the Jordan River, the old city of Jerusalem with the Temple Mount and the Sinai Desert and they stood on the outskirts of Cairo, Egypt. And all of that in six days. It was a miracle. And it was exactly 2,300 years, a day for a year, after Alexander the Great had a miraculous victory in his war against the Persian Empire. A miraculous victory, and then 2,300 years later, another miraculous victory. And they recaptured the Temple Mount where the Holy Temple had stood all those centuries prior. 2,000 years before, that's where the Temple of God stood. Well, see, Paul, in Philippians chapter 3, tells us, Brethren, don't be negative. Don't look back on the past with crying in your beard. Don't, don't be pessimistic. You know, you look at your cup and you see it's got wine in it. A half a cup of wine. Now the negative person will look at that and say, my cup of wine is half empty. But a positive-minded person will look at that cup of wine and say, well, my cup of wine is half full. It's all the outlook. It's like the story I've told before about the two prisoners in a jail, looking out through the bars. One prisoner looked out through the bars of his jail cell and saw the mud at the ground. The other prisoner looked out through the bars up to the heavens and saw the stars. One was bopey dope pessimism on a rope. The other one was cheerful, looking up to the heavens, climbing Jacob's ladder. We don't get anywhere bemoaning the past. We should forget the past like the Apostle Paul says right here in Philippians 3, he says, by any means, if I may attain the resurrection from the dead in the future, I don't consider that I've already done it, or that I'm already perfect, that I'm a perfect man now. He says, no, but I press on, verse 12, that I may lay hold on that for which Christ Jesus has called me, chosen me, and laid hold on me to reveal his precious truth to me. So he says in verse 13, Brethren, I do not count myself as having gained the truth or apprehended everything. I don't know at all. He said, but one thing I do know, forgetting all those things which are behind me, 
I'm reaching forward to those things which are in front of me, which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the re reward of the high calling of God in Christ. I press ahead. I surge forward. I exercise my muscles to plow ahead. So let's do the same thing. Let's not become negative and get overwhelmed by past mistakes, but just forget them. Treat them like garbage, like rubbish. Take a shower and look toward the future. So Paul went on to say, verse 11, not that I speak in regard to needs, for I've learned whatever state I am in, whatever state I'm in today, I'm content. We don't need to bemoan the fact that we don't own a house or several houses, that we made mistakes in the past. We can just forget it. Learn to be content. Accept your situation that God has placed you in and just be a light. Let your light shine with goodness and positiveness and warmth. Giving and serving. Be a light to your wife, a light to your children. Humble. Accepting. Not critical. Don't be critical. So Paul says in verse 10, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. How much do you care for God's work? How much do you care for the ministry? How much are you praying for me and Cappy and Walter and Debbie and the other members of the church that are doing the work and supporting the church and the work Where is your heart? Paul said, I have learned, verse 12, how to be abased or humbled. We're all learning that. That's part of the process. We have to learn to walk in humility and not pride. And he said, I also know how to abound, to, to be blessed, how to suffer blessings. I have learned both, he says, to be full and to be hungry, both to abound with blessings and to suffer needs, to suffer needs. Verse 13, he says, I can endure all these things through Christ who strengthens me in the inner man and with the Spirit of God the spirit of power and of love and of a sound, balanced mind. A mind which is not depressed or negative or pessimistic, but a sound, rational, balanced mind. And Paul says in verse 19, my God will supply all your needs, whatever they are, your need. My God will supply them according to the riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Yeshua, the Messiah, is our provider, our supplier, our protector. He sends the Spirit of God to enable us, to strengthen us. He sends angels of God to surround us 
to protect us, to protect our property, to protect his work. So we need, I think, brethren, this day of Thanksgiving, in prayer, I learned from watching this movie about William Bradford. After read, seeing this movie and having read what I have in the past, I am convinced personally that he was a true Christian. A mighty man of God. He, God used him to found and establish the Plymouth Rock Colony of the Plymouth Brethren, living by the Bible the best they understood, searching the scriptures for a form of government, worshiping Christ, and not following the dictates of paganism. They didn't have all the truth, but they had plenty. They had what God gave them and his love and mercy. And he quoted from the scriptures often in his writings and his epistles. And when they celebrated the first Thanksgiving, what we call Thanksgiving, they called the Harvest Day of Thanks and celebrated it with their Indian neighbors who had befriended them. And they played games and had archery contests and musket contests and races and wrestling contests. And they shared the bounty of God's blessing. And God blessed them and established the colony. And it began to prosper and grow. And then they learned about the beaver hides up in Maine and all the beaver there. And they sent trappers forth to trap the beaver. Because right at that time, 1623, a year or so after the first Thanksgiving, beaver pelts became enormously wealthy. That is, worth a great deal of money. The price of beaver pelts rose astronomically. Like 20, 30 times back in England. And now they were right in the front of the cusp of trapping beavers and making their pelts and shipping them back to London, making a profit. And the merchants back in London, with their eyeballs were ringing up cash register signs, like in a casino. And they saw money, money, money in beaver pelts. And so they invested and sent more men across the Atlantic to join the pilgrims. Before you know it, New England, which had had 70,000 Indians and only about 50 surviving pilgrims, and they were blessed and the pilgrims grew to be a hundred and then a thousand, and then in just a few years, 140,000 new settlers from England because God blessed the Plymouth Rock colony. They were the beginning, the incipient start of a new nation called the United States of America. The tribe of Ephraim and the tribes of Israel. They lost ten tribes coming together to form a new empire in the West. The Republic of the United States of America, founded and established by the Plymouth Colony Brethren, which God blessed and ordained and established as he began his process of fulfilling the promises made to Abraham where he said I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you and after Israel went into captivity 
in 718 and 721 BC to the Assyrian Empire and then migrated through Europe into Western Europe and into the British Isles and then 2,620 years later, 2,000, no, 2,520 years later, a day for a year, God promised that Israel would be cursed for seven times. A time is 360 days or a year, a prophetic year. Seven times 360 is 2,520 years. In Leviticus chapter 26, God said they would be punished for seven times, 2,520 years. Count from 718 B.C., 2,520 years, and you come to 1803 A.D. What happened in 1803 A.D.? That is when Thomas Jefferson, President of the United States, bought the Louisiana Territory from Napoleon Bonaparte of France. All the territory from the Mississippi River up to Michigan and Wisconsin and Wyoming. In Montana, down south to Utah and Nevada, in Washington State, and Oregon, the Oregon Territory, in Texas, that huge territory west of the Mississippi River, bought from the French. And the cry went out, Go West, young man, go West, by Horace Greeley. And they sought to expand the population and march westward, ho, and settle the continent from sea to shining sea. How did this come about? The blessings of Abraham were now to be fulfilled. The captivity was over. The time of expansion had begun. And by the days of Theodore Roosevelt, America had become one of the great powers in the world. By 1900, so in Colossians, chapter 3, Verse 1, Paul says, If you therefore were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Don't seek things of this world. Don't think, seek to make your fortune in this world. Put your eyes on the world to come, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Christ. As Paul says in verse 2, Set your mind, your attention, your focus on things above, not on the things of this mundane planet called Earth. For when you died spiritually and were buried in baptism, your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life today, reappears on the scene, then you also will appear with him in glory. So he says, brethren, therefore put to death your human members of lust and the flesh which are on the earth. Lust, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, 
covetousness, greed for money, which is idolatry, he says. For you yourselves once walked with the, this world and its lust and covetousness and idolatry. And because of these things, the wrath of God is coming on the world, on the sons of disobedience. But now, verse 8, you yourselves are to put these things out of your life. Anger, bitterness, depression, disillusionment, negative thinking, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language. Put them away from you. Don't lie to one another. You're supposed to put off the old man, the old you, with all of his evil deeds, and put on the new man in Christ, who is renewed in knowledge, according to the image of Christ, of God, who created him. We're made in God's image. God wants us to become like him in character. Christ is all in all. So put on, as elect of God, verse 12, tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering patience. Bear with one another. Don't criticize one another. Uplift one another. Forgive one another slights. And, and petty bickerings and arguments. Forgive. If anyone has some complaint against another, forgive it, even like Christ forgave you. But above everything, Paul said, put on love. Love your neighbor, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God dwell in your hearts. Be a person of peace, a peacemaker, a peace seeker, like our forefather Jacob. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts, verse 15, to which you were called in one body. And, and what? And what? And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you in all wisdom, teaching one another, admonishing, encouraging one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts with grace to the Lord. And whatever you do in your life, he says, in word or deed, anything you say, Anything you do in works or deeds, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Give God thanks. Be a thankful person. Have a thankful heart. Go through your life day by day, all day long, morning till night, Dawn till dusk, being thankful, expressing gratitude, smiling, rejoicing, thanking God you're alive, thanking God for every blessing you have. Enumerate them, count them, write them down in a list. Page after page, number one, what am I thankful for? Write it down. Number two, what am I thankful for? Write it down and keep on writing until you run out of things. Then go back over your list and start over again and fill in the blanks. It must be 
millions of things, if you could really think about it, to be thankful for. Every breath, your eyesight, your nose, so you can smell beautiful smells like a wonderful steak dinner or a turkey in the oven or your taste, that delicious apple pie and the birds you can see and that your feeling of touch all the things we can be thankful for, life and health, our wives, our children, their lives, their blessings. Get our minds off ourselves and onto serving God and praising God and thanking God and Christ for all they've done for us, for Christ our Savior. This year at Thanksgiving, I thank God that he protected our property and the headquarters of his work here in Omak from the fires, the raging wildfires that burned everything around us, north, east, south, and west. Yet our enclave, our property was protected right at the property line. Our poplars are still standing. Our chickens are still alive and thriving. And new golden comets are giving four or five eggs a day. My wife says five. We're blessed. Verse 17. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So how thankful are we, brethren, that we're alive, that we've been blessed with the blessings of God and Christ, and they are looking out after us. God is in heaven, and he's ruling the world and the universe, and we are his children and the flock of his pasture. So I think we can say with David, Psalm 23, the shepherd's psalm. The Lord Jehovah is my shepherd, I shall not go wanting. He makes me lie down in green pastures where the soil is fertile. He leads me beside the calm, quiet, still waters where all is peaceful and tranquil. He restores my soul, my life. He blesses me. He leads me in the paths of righteousness, of obedience to his wonderful law, his Torah, for his name's sake. Yea, even though I walk through trials and tests and temptation and flood and famine and sword in the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear any evil because God is with me. Your rod, your staff, comfort me and protect me. You prepare a table before me of food. In the presence of my enemies, you provide for me bountifully. My cup runs over with blessings. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell and live in the house of the Lord for length of days forever, for eternity. Give thanks to the Lord. Be thankful to Him for everything. With faith and with eyes focused forward and fixed 
on the kingdom of God and Christ at the Father's right hand. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank Him for all of His people that He's working with and through. Thank Him for William Bradford and the Puritans and the Pilgrims. Thank Him for Billy Graham, the Coptic Christians who died for Christ, and the Christians in Iraq and Syria. Thank Him for our brethren that keep Sunday because they don't know about the Sabbath. And thank Him for the ones who do keep the Sabbath, who are blessed with that knowledge. Thank God for His great, awesome, generous love, of which we are so undeserving. Thank God for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Thank Him for the Holy Spirit that dwells in us and gives us strength and earnest of our inheritance. And thank Him for Christ the Messiah, who died for us and who lives again, seated at the right hand of God the Father. Thank God He is God, and we are the sheep of His pasture. Praise His holy name. Rukata Adonai Yehovah Eloheinu Melech Haolam. Amen.